Hey everyone, I want to start off by saying that the review sheet um, that says Chapter 3 Calculator Extension Problems and it looks like this. You do not need to worry about this one for your exam. We will be going over this um, eventually because these are AP exam questions, um, but you are not responsible for them for this upcoming exam. Also, I posted these solutions to the other two optimization problems, and you can find those on my website. They are uh, a bit more challenging. The one on your exam is not as difficult. I would compare the level of difficulty on the exam with the question on your optimization guided notes, example three, something maybe similar to that. Okay. With the first question on that um, practice test, I guess you can call it, with those chapter three review problems, we had to find the extrema of two x plus five cosine x over the interval from zero to two pi. And in order to find the extrema, we take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and also check where the derivative does not exist, but in this case, um, that's not applicable. So when we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero, we get that x is arc sine of two fifths and pi minus arc sine of two fifths because we're going over that one whole revolution from zero to two pi. So when you get these two critical numbers, 0.412 and 2.73, which you can evaluate in your calculator, you can substitute those back in for the original function g. Okay, so substituting them back in for the original function g. You would end up with 5.41 and 0.878. Don't forget when we're looking on a closed interval, we want to check what's happening at the endpoints. So when you're checking what's happening at the endpoints, just substitute those values into the original function and see where our y values stand to see if we have any maxes or mins on the endpoints of the interval. In doing so, I get g of 0 equals 5 and g of 2 pi is about 17.57. So we could make our sign chart or we could just compare the y values and try to think about what this graph might look like. If you look at this curve, you can see that we have a relative maximum at that coordinate from our critical number, 0.412 comma 5.41, so right about here. That's a relative max. Then we have an absolute or global minimum at 2.73 comma 0.878. And then we have our absolute maximum here up at 2 pi comma 17.57. Um, obviously, this is not drawn to scale, but this is just to demonstrate what's going on in this picture. Question number three is pretty straightforward. Uh, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, or identify where the derivative does not exist, which is not applicable here because it's a polynomial. So when you set this equal to zero, uh, the key is, again, we need to know how to factor. So when we factor this, we end up with x equals 7 thirds and x equals 1. Problem number four is pretty interesting. Um, the idea, which you need to understand, is that we're taking the second derivative. We are setting that second derivative equal to 0, um, trying to figure out if we have any inflection points. We're also trying to figure out where the second derivative does not exist to see if we have any possible inflection points there. Uh, so the, the two possible inflection points are at 0 and at negative 1. And setting up our interval from negative infinity to negative 1, if you were to substitute in a test point there, um, since we're taking the square root, we get an imaginary number. So this is not going to be concave up, nor, nor is it going to be concave down. Um, then when we check our next two intervals, we are concave up for both intervals. We're, we're not changing from down to up or up to down. 
So zero is not an inflection point either. So to answer the question, there are no points of inflection. And by the way, this symbol with the three dots, this means therefore. So therefore, there are no points of inflection. But if you had to discuss the concavity, I would say that this graph is concave up from negative 1 to infinity. Okay, for number five, this is a curve sketching question, but they are giving you the information um, in a different format, and you're not finding the information. It's given to you. So we know the intercepts are at 0, 0, and at 6, 0. We also know we have critical numbers at 3 and at 5. So we're going to set up our chart for the first derivative using those critical numbers 3 and 5 and try to determine if we have a max or a min anywhere. So they tell us that, this, that the first derivative is positive for the first interval, which means we're increasing, positive for that second interval, which means we're increasing still, and then we change to negative for that last interval, which means we're decreasing. So that means we have a maximum at 5. And now that I'm looking at the curve that I drew, I made a little error because I sketched this really quickly. Um, I'll fix that for you in a minute. So let's keep going, and then I'll, I'll show you where I made an error. For the second derivative, we know that we have possible inflection points based on the given info at 3 and at 4. So when we look at the second derivative test, they tell us that the second derivative is negative, for the first interval, which means that f is concave down. It tells us that the second derivative is positive for that middle, middle interval, so we know f is concave up. And finally, f prime, f double prime, excuse me, is negative for that last interval, which means f is concave down. Since it is changing from down to up and then up to down, 3 and 4 are both inflection points. So at 3 and at 4, we have points of inflection. Putting this curve together, you might be able to see where I made my error. We are increasing from negative infinity until we get to 5. I somehow created a little max and min here that shouldn't exist. Um, so we're increasing until we get to 5, and then decreasing from 5 onward. And let me just show you what the more accurate sketch of this graph should look like. So this is a better picture of what you should have there, where we would be increasing until we reach this maximum over here at 5. But notice the concavity does change from concave down, not holding any water, and then there is a little bit of a swoop where we could hold some water between 3 and 4, that would be concave up. And then from 4 onward, we are then very, very distinctly concave down. Okay, moving on to the next problem. 6, 7, and 8 are some limits at infinity. These are just a couple of examples. We've seen several. So number 6, um, we notice that the powers of the numerator and denominator are equal. So the quick trick is just to take those leading coefficients. And the answer for number 6 is 2, which means we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2. Number 7 was a typo. I meant to do the limit as x approaches infinity of 2 sine x over x. Um, but in case you're curious, the originally typed question, x over 2 sine x, that would be approaching both negative and positive infinity, so the limit does not exist. But the answer I was looking for... Um, for the fixed typo there would be zero because that is a special limit at infinity and the answer would be zero. Number eight, we did one like this together in class. Um, my algebra there is just sort of fuzzy um, but I think we discussed how you could kind of think of this as the same thing as number 6 almost, and you're looking at that square root of x squared and kind of thinking of it as 1x. Um, so taking these coefficients, you have negative 1 over 2, but we're approaching negative infinity. Uh, so the outcome here is positive 1 half. Number 9 is a beast, and 
it's definitely really, really good practice, especially for taking your derivatives here. But this is a monster problem. Um, I can do my best to explain quickly, um, but no, on your exam, you will not have one this challenging. So if we're looking at a right triangle, we know we're going to be using Pythagorean theorem here to set up that relationship um, to find the length for the hypotenuse. But then we only want to have our primary equation in terms of one variable. So to get it in terms of one variable, we need to identify how to rewrite one of these x1, y1s in terms of the other. So in this scenario, you're going to write a linear equation for that line that represents the hypotenuse. So we're going to write an equation that represents that line. Well, the nice thing is we know the slope. The slope rise over run is just negative y1 over x1. And then we know the y-intercept. It's just y1. So in y equals mx plus b form, we do have an equation here that will relate y1 with x1. So simplifying this equation, um, you would see that x1 is equal to y1 over y1 minus 8 when we evaluate it at the point 1, 8, because that point does exist on our line. So remember from Algebra 1, if you are passing through a point, you can either plug that into point slope form, or what I did was plug it into slope intercept form. And now I have x1 equal to y1 over y1 minus 8. I'm going to go ahead and replace now that x1 in my Pythagorean theorem equation for h. In doing so, I get this. h equals y1 over y1 minus 8 squared plus y1 squared, and then square root of the entire thing. All right, to show you the next few steps, it's a lot of work to take the derivative of this. I mean, it's pretty nasty. So let me go ahead and show you the derivative, and then you will see how you should arrive at the following answers. The vertices would be 5 comma 0 and 0 comma 10. And now that should hopefully make sense, that that's about the points where we would lie. Um, but I will show you how y1 equals 10 does end up being our minimum value. And then you would just plug 10 back in to arrive at the x-coordinate, which would be 5. So again, we are going to find that 10 is the minimum. You take that 10, plug it back into here to solve for x1, and then we have both of our vertices being 5 comma 0 and 0 comma 10. Just to briefly explain some of my work on the derivative here, uh, what I should have done from the beginning was instead of using x1, y1, because that gets confusing, we could have just said a and b. Um, so from now on, I'm going to just go ahead and replace my y1 with b just to take the derivative. So here's my h rewritten just using b. Okay, so to take the derivative of this, we have to use chain rule because it is all to the one half. And then when we multiply by the inside derivative, we're using quotient rule here. So it gets a little bit ugly. This is the derivative right here. But moving forward, because remember, we want to set this thing equal to 0, and this is almost nearly impossible to solve for b as is if we set it equal to 0 now. So I'm going to start doing a couple you know, algebraic manipulations. I see there's a common factor of 2b that can be factored out of each of these terms. When I take out that 2b to the outside, the 2s will cancel with the numerator and denominator. And then moving forward, we can simplify each of these terms by dividing out a b minus 8. And you get this. Finally, if I put it all together as one numerator and one denominator, you would see that in the denominator, you can factor out a b squared. Underneath that whole radical business, you can factor out a b squared. Okay? And then the square root of b squared is b. So this b will cancel with this b. And then our final answer for the derivative is this, which it's still not pretty, but we can work with it. So this is our first derivative. 
Finally, remember, since this is optimization, we want to find some critical numbers and see where we have maxes or mins. In this scenario, we want a min. So when the derivative equals zero, now this is some nasty algebra um, you can try to work out, you would get that b equals 10. So when you set that equal to zero and solve it for b, you get 10. Where the derivative does not exist is where that denominator equals zero, which ends up giving us imaginary results. So we're not going to use anything from that as any critical numbers because they are imaginary. We only want the real numbers. So 10 is going to be that breaking point in our interval where we test if it is indeed a min. So using your chart from negative infinity to 10, sorry, this is kind of messy. I just did a test point of 9, and the result is negative. Okay, so we are decreasing. From 10 to infinity, I did the test point of 11, and it is positive, which means we are increasing. So if we are going from decreasing to increasing, that means 10 is definitely a minimum. So if you go back then and check your uh, cross-check with the solution, you'll see 10 being the minimum for that y would give me that 5 is that x-coordinate there, and we have our vertices of the right triangle, and you have answered the question. Okay, I hope this wasn't too crazy overwhelming. Study, do your best, and I will see you tomorrow.